feel like I'm a cover band or something for... Uh, we have a lot of ground to cover. I didn't feel comfortable adjusting Dr. Levinson's presentation very much, so we have only 93 slides to cover. Uh, so with no further ado, we can, be, um, we can begin. Discourse analysis or text linguistics, to use the European term, takes into account factors that are not treated in Greek grammars, which normally are concerned with morphology or syntax. Uh, in particular, it concerns features of larger context than individual sentence. It may simply focus on how the contents of the previous sentence affects the way the current sentence is structured. However, it also looks for ways in which the author's purpose influences the way information in each sentence is presented. This presentation begins with a brief review of my journey, uh, or Stephen's journey, uh, to, my, to his current position as a discourse linguist. My wife and I became members of Wycliffe Bible Translators in 1965 and began work with the Inga people of Columbia three years later. Before leaving the UK, we spent two summers in what was called the Summer Institute of Linguistics, receiving training in field linguistics. The model we learned was one devised by John Binder Samuel called Syntagmatics, and it served us well for our first four years among the Ingas. Uh, we returned to the UK in 1972 for me to study for an MA in linguistic science at the University of Reading. One course introduced us to three linguistic schools that were then in vogue, Chomsky's Transformational Generative Grammar, Pike and Longacre's Tag Mimics, and Halliday's Systemics, with the lecturer pointing out the strengths and weaknesses of each. However, as I started uh, working on my dissertation on discourse features of the Inga language, my supervisor, Peter Matthews, took one look at my corpus and said, you need to use a Prague school approach. This led, uh, among the things, to my rejecting the Halliday and two-way division of every sentence into a theme, the initial constituent, and a ream, the new information. Instead, I followed Binich uh, in treating the initial adverbial constituents as what he called points of departure with the rest of the sentence maintaining the theme and the ream, or also called the topic comment division. The following English sentence illustrates the differences between the two approaches. So while the two would divide uh, sentence one in the same way, uh, when you have an additional constituent that's not the th formally the theme as we have in, in sentence two with the point of departure, you can see the, the problems you run into because then the balance of the clause uh, would, would be lumped under the ream. Uh, another Prague School linguist from whose work I benefited was Jan Furbos. He was concentrating at the time on what was called the functional sentence perspective um, and was proposing a number of functional reasons for changes in the order of constituents in a sentence, observations that I would build on studying constituent order in New Testament Greek. After completing my MA, we returned to South America and in 1974 held a workshop in Panama during which the participants first studied discourse features in their local languages and then studied and then applied their results to the translation of New Testament passages in those languages. Uh, when we came to the second part, we discovered to our horror that whereas we had gained a reasonable understanding of a number of discourse features in the local languages, no one seemed to have studied the corresponding features in New Testament Greek. This eventually led me to Reading University to undertake doctoral studies in the Greek of Acts, majoring on the factors that influence constituent order uh, and distinguishing the functions of different particles and conjunctions used in the books, which we'll talk about more below. Uh, I completed my doctorate in 1980, but have continued to refine my approach to discourse analysis as I encounter relevant insights from other linguists. The following are five of these insights. First, Dreyer's language types. When linguists started to divide languages into types, so talking about typological characteristics and such, they began with, uh, they initially identified them as SVO or VSO languages uh, based on verb or subject, verb, and object. So you will find New Testament grammar listed as a VSO language. A breakthrough occurred with Matthew Dreyer proposed that languages should be classified on the basis of two variables, 
So whether or not the object follows the verb, so VO versus OV, and whether or not the subject commonly follows the verb, so VS versus SV. This leads to New Testament Greek being classified as a VSVO language. And this would allow us then to uh, kind of categorize it with, with languages that would have similar characteristics and similar uh, behavioral traits in terms of how different features are handled. Um, a language being VS type if it's common in narratives for the noun phrase in topic comment sentences to follow the verb, which is what you'd be familiar with in, in Greek. A number of discourse features tend to correlate with Dreyer's variables, one of them being, uh, and this would be uh, Simon Deke's constituent order template uh, for VS languages. Deke's template was originally proposed for Hungarian, but is equally applicable to ancient, uh, to ancient Hebrew and New Testament Greek based on that uh, VS uh, characteristic that we saw or mentioned. The template is P1, P2, V, and X, where position one, P1, is occupied by one or more points of departure. Uh, so from a traditional grammar standpoint that we talk, basically traditional grammar would talk about two reasons for fronting something in the sentence, contrast and emphasis. Um, they're essentially right in, in the sense of that would correlate with Deke's two categories of P1, P2, P1 being contrast, P2 being emphasis. Um, but the traditional grammars didn't really talk about having multiple fronted constituents and that's what, what Deke is accounting for. Um, in, uh, excuse me, I should say, 1 Thessalonians 5, 7 illustrates the P1 and P2 positions. Uh, the sentence concerns those who sleep, which is the theme or topic, which is in P1, uh, and the ream or comment about the theme is sleep at night, with the focus, uh, and the focus is nuktos at night, which is in P2. So P2 would be that the most important information in the clause that's been placed in a position of prominence before the verb. It would have been the most important part of the clause regardless of its location, but it's uh, for prominence sake that it's been brought out front. Uh, and I'll be talking more about that tomorrow. Uh, point three, relevance theory claims about marked forms and added implicatures. In his 1989 article on the English progressive, for instance, Am Living, Ziggurat uh, argues for the need to distinguish between the meaning of the construction and the different overtones that arise when it's used in certain contexts. So I could talk about something like, it's raining outside, but if I said something like, John is being nice, I've talked about something that is, is not a state that's going to change as though it is something that is changeable. And that's the kind of overtone, that is the mild reproof, insincerity, or temporariness that can be achieved by using a, a form that's typically found in one context in a, in a context you wouldn't normally expect it, and that's where these overtones come from. Uh, Ziggurat also... Um, distinguishes between contexts in which the tense form is the default or more relevant way of portraying an event and marked usages of the form. Um, if one tense form is the most relevant way of portraying an event, but an author chooses to use a different form instead, then to quote Goethe 1991, he must have intended to convey special contextual effects. Um, what is crucial to this relevance theory approach is uh, to default in marked forms, one that distinguishes it from uh, those of both Porter and Longacre, is that the effect of using a marked form varies from context to context. So for Longacre and Porter, they would tend to view a marked form as something that applies globally, that's more of a semantic trait of the tense form or whatever it is that's, that's been described, where... Uh, Levinson's approach and me following Levinson would be looking at this more from a, a functional standpoint in terms of usage in one context versus another. Uh, so I argued in a 2010 article on aspect and prominence in the synoptic accounts of Jesus' entry into Jerusalem, um, distinguishing between the meaning of a tense form, such as the imperfect, which remains basically unchanged, and the overtones associated with it, which vary with the context um, that results in an approach to prominence that is intuitively more satisfying than one that 
in, in which a fixed degree of prominence is assigned to each tense form. It is helpful too to distinguish between occasions when tense when the tense form is the most relevant way of portraying each event and those in which it is not, as this explains why the same form sometimes uh, seems to be for a foregrounding device, device where in other passages it is not. The relevance theory approach to particles and conjunctions. Most New Testament grammarians gr uh, describe Greek connectives in terms of the different senses in which they are employed. However, my experience as a discourse linguist in Latin America made me realize that for native speakers of a language, and this goes to uh, Dr. Porter's important point about thinking about one language in terms of another rather than thinking about Greek in Greek or as Greek um, from the descriptive framework, um, each conjunction imposes a specific constraint on the way the sentence concerned is to be processed with reference to its context. Um, this position was formalized in a 1998 book by Raboul and Mushler. Um, in which they viewed each conjunction as a linguistic marker which one, links a linguistic or discourse unit of any size to its context. So it will introduce something but you don't know how large the unit is that it introduces. And two, gives instructions as to how uh, to relate this unit to its context. So the relationship with what precedes. And three, constrains conclusions to be drawn on the basis of the discourse conjunction or discourse connection that might not have been drawn had it been absent. So the, the, use, of a prep, or the use of a conjunction compared to a syndeton, meaning no conjunction, um, the use of a syndeton would be not giving you any indication where the presence of an explicit conjunction would constrain and narrow the range of possibilities. This definition, for example, um, that if gar is read in Galatians 1.11, then the way that verse 11 is to be related to its context is different from the way in which it is to be related if the textual variant de is read. And he'll return to this point below. The third part of the definition uh, constrains conclusions to be drawn on the basis of this discourse connection that might not have been drawn and it's at, had it been absent. Also leads to the rejection of the assertions that uh, such as un is, is in a has an assertive, uh, an adversative sense, as Dana and Manti claim, and others. Um, instead, inferential un would be understood to be used in an adversative context, and it relates to the following. And it relates to the following sentence. It relates that the following sentence is not to be related to the context in an adversative way. Rather, it constrains that what follows is to be processed as a distinct point that advances an argument in an inferential way. Uh, the perfect in context. Um, at a conference in 2016 on the perfect in Indo-European languages, I learned of Nishiyama and Krunig's analysis of a corpus of English texts which contained 600 instances of the perfect. No less than 583 of these instances involved the elaboration of an existing topic by referring to a past state of affairs that is of current relevance to that topic. For example, Newspapers, uh, newspapers often introduce a topic and a title and then elaborate on it in the perfect, as in spending on death slashed in the past four years. And the, the key point is uh, that the, for the people in Wales with hearing loss, the funding had been, has been slashed. So it's, it's looking at this past event that they're, uh, that's relevant as a basis for the claims they're making. At first sight, the Greek perfect appears to function in a similar way to its counterpart in English. And again, connecting back to Stan, the um, traditional grammars have tended to kind of read the English perfect over the Greek, uh, regardless of whether that's actually capturing what's going on. Um, namely, to elaborate on an existing topic by referring to a past state of affairs that is of current relevance um, to that topic. In Hebrews 1.5c, for instance, you have Gigenica uh, that elaborates on, you are my son. However, if translations into English are compared with the Greek text, one finds that English often uses a present perfect. Uh, and, and in this paper, Dr. 
Levinson is talking about the perfect as a tense form, not just the perfect. So he'd be talking about perfect, pluperfect, hence the present perfect as opposed to a, a past perfect, which would be your pluperfect, if that's perfectly clear. Uh, <laughs> for example, uh, perfect, it is typically used in English in the second part of the opening sentence of Hebrews. Um, but in these last days, he has spoken since the second clause elaborates on the topic of God speaking um, that was introduced in the first clause and the event concern that took place in the past uh, but has perfect, uh, has current relevance to the topic. Nevertheless, the Greek verb elalesin uh, is in the aorist. This discrepancy results at least in part from the fact that English is a tense prominent language, whereas New Testament Greek is an aspect prominent language. The following paragraph uh, of, from Levinson's paper summarizes the conclusions about uh, the pragmatic effects of using the present perfect indicative in the Greek, in the Greek of Hebrews. Um, so where New Testament Greek is an aspect prominent language, uses the aorist form to present events uh, the, the aorist form presents events that are both past and, and present. Um, there's, an, there's no need to actualize past events in a tense prominent language, as, as there is in a tense prominent language. This explains why English sometimes translates Greek aorist as present perfects. Rather than the perfect indicative being employed every time reference is made to a past event that elaborates on an existing topic, Greek tends to limit its use to restatements of past events and speeches, um, often with the implication that exposition of the topic is now completed. When aorist perfect alternation occurs and the readers or hearers may have expected the aorist to be used, the so-called aorist aristic perfect is a marked form with added implicatures. Uh, when found at or towards the end of a passage, assertions in the perfect often clinch the argument or of a climactic nature. Uh, when used at the beginning of a narrative passage, in contrast, the perfect is more of a backgrounding device, pointing forward to and highlighting what follows. The conclusion to be drawn here is that the five instances in which insights from other linguists uh, influencing his thinking is that New Testament Greek discourse studies can benefit greatly from advances made by linguists um, who are working in, with discourse features in other languages, uh, especially if the language concerned is aspect prominent. As I move on to the second part of my presentation, I'd like to point out um, that the approach I discovered um, that I, I approach the discourse features of the Greek New Testament book from a functional perspective, namely one that attempts to discover and describe what linguistic structures are used for, the functions they serve, and the factors that condition their use. One basic principle of a functional approach is that when an author has the option of expressing him or herself in more than one way, the ways, and the ways differ in significance. There are reasons for the variations. For example, there is often a choice as to which particle or conjunction is the most appropriate way to link two sentences. Choosing a particular connective over against another is not just a question of style, rather there's a functional reason for, the, for choosing them. Um, the following are a series of steps that an analyst might follow when considering the discourse structure of the Greek, of the Greek text of a New Testament book. I illustrate these steps from Galatians. Determine the nature of the discourse. Um, I'm going to skip over this just for sake of time. Um, but the the example he begins with is uh, begins as a kind of a foil of Hans Dieter Betts analysis of Galatians, where he's broken it into formal rhetorical sections of verses one to five as the exordium. Uh, I'm sorry, excuse me, the prescript in one to five, verses six to eleven, the exordium. Uh, Chapter 112 through 214 is the narratio, the propositio in verses, chapter 2, verses 15 to 21, the probatio in 3 1 to 431, where it's, it's, it's expecting that, that Paul's thinking is driven by those formal rhetorical features. And critiques, you have critiques of Longacre and F.F. Bruce kind of pushing back and saying, 
it's unlikely that someone would have thought in those in those kinds of specific styles. Um, determine the broad genre of the letter, and this is significant. The broad genre of the letter is hortatory since its concern is to change the behavior of the recipients. According to Burton, the central purpose of the letter is to arrest the progress of the Judaizing propaganda, which the Galatians were on the very point of accepting and to win them back to faith in Jesus Christ from the works of the law. It follows that we can expect the rebukes and exhortations of Galatians to constitute the theme of the letter, that call of, of, to change. Where to quote SIL linguist Mary Bray's the theme line, quote, presents the backbone of the letter, of the discourse, whether this be the main points of the argument, the main points of the commands of an exhortation, while the supportive material provides all that is necessary as a background uh, or the basis for understanding the story, procedure, or argument of the whole. Determine where there is a general consensus as to the major divisions. Um, John Beekman and Callow write that the basic criterion for delineating a unit is that the section or paragraph that deals with one theme. So if, if the theme changes, then the new unit that has started, um, what gives a section or paragraph its overall coherence as a semantic unit is the fact that one subject matter is being dealt with. As an aside, one of the reasons I took, I look at how exegetes have divided the text in a New Testament book is that I do not expect discourse analysts to come, to, to come up with radically different new ideas as to the structure of the book. Rather, discourse analysis provides a tool for evaluating existing proposals and for, for, for savoring some of them over against others. Step four, look at surface features uh, that support the different boundary features, the point that support different boundaries. Surface features that can be cited as supporting evidence for the different boundaries that have been proposed on thematic grounds include the following. Uh, fronted constituent, which was referred to as P1, so the contrastive topic idea um, that presents a new theme or situation. See, for example, the fronting of to evangelion, to evangelis, evangelistin uh, in uh, Galatians 1.11, as well as change of the situation described at the beginning of 6.1, so with the conditional aeon clause. Uh, closure, so you can end a unit as, as just as easily as you can begin one, so th things like with Amen in verse 1.5. Uh, chiastic structure in chapter 3 verses 2 to 14 that ends up functioning as a structure, a unit that can be embedded with respect to something else marked then by the, the resumption. Uh, an inclusio structure involving, uh, according to Guthrie, the bracketing of a pericope by making a statement at the beginning of the section in approximation of which is repeated in the conclusion of the section. So we see that in 316 and the resumption in 329. Uh, summarizing expressions as it unites together the information to which it alludes thereby um, thereby implies that the preceding material is to be treated as a block over against what follows. So we see this in 431 um, with the summarizing expression um, the summarizing expression in conclusion which Betts says is not only the resume of the, the meaning of the allegory of 421 to 31, but is the entire pro, uh, probatio section. Rhetorical questions are another way of marking uh, a division, uh, such as the rhetorical question in 3.1. Um, vocative expressions. Uh, so forms of direct address, whether it's in nominative or vocative. So adolfoi or ha anomato, uh, Anoete galatai. Um, an orienter, a verb, uh, a verb which introduces a new theme, such as tavmazo or uh, gonorizo humin, um, introducing and drawing attention to the proposition that's introduced. 
a shift a shift of two or more of the following verbal features. So tense, aspect, um, mood, and person. For example, the final verb in uh, 610, ergodzamatha, is a first person plural subjunctive, whereas the initial verb, idete, is a second person plural aorist imperative. Back reference is another, so essentially something that would loop back, um, which involves reference to the preceding paragraph, paragraphs, or pointer points within the preceding paragraphs, and often occurs at the beginning of a new paragraph. Such references are particularly significant when they introduce a concept um, or entity that is, um, that is not featured in the immediate context. For, for example, the last reference to you in Galatians 3.1. Although these surface features, I ripped you off. Uh, hook words, I'm gonna skip over that until we have, have time. Um, although these surface features may be cited as supporting evidence for a boundary proposed because of the perceived change of theme, there may be other reasons uh, for them to be used. For example, vocatives uh, are used not only at the beginning of a new section, but also as a means of highlighting an important assertion, as in 419 with technamu and the thematically loaded expression that follows. Uh, considering implications of intersentential conjunction used. Um, as I suggested earlier, each intersentential conjunction conveys a particular constraint on interpretation. So the presence of a conjunction at a proposed boundary will indicate how what follows is to be related to the context. The following are the constraints associated with some of the intersentential conjunctions found in Galatians. Allah would be plus countering. So as Fresh states, it instructs the recipients, the recipient to process a corrective relation holding between the two pieces of information. Gar plus strengthening. It constrains the reader to process the material it introduces as strengthening an assertion. So it's, it's, it's a offering offline information from Longacre's standpoint. Um, doesn't mean it's unimportant to so try to think of a memory verse that doesn't begin with four, and you'll be challenged. I generally give out a buck or two or five in a classroom setting to have someone come up with something. But from a, from a discourse standpoint, it's strengthening something that proceeds. De uh, is on the preceding slide. Um, plus distinctive, so it constrains what follows to be processed as a distinct point that advances the argument of the letter. Epite, next, it marks chronological sequence. Ke, uh, plus associative or additive. It constrains the material introduced to be processed as being added to or associated with previous material. Un, inferential, plus inferential, plus distinctive, as was mentioned earlier. Vio, plus inferential, plus continuative. It contrasts with un in that it does not move the argument to a new point, uh, but has the same inferential, uh, inferential constraint. Hosta is plus inferential plus result. It constrains what follows to be processed as the result, actual, natural, perceived, or intended, to quote Porter, as to what, is previous, what was previously been stated. So sections three and four discuss how the presence of some of these conjunctions impact the macro structure of the letter and the flow of the argument within pericopes. So now we're gonna look at prominence giving devices at various levels. Prominence, device, prominence giving devices include repetition of clauses or sentences, as in 1, 8, and 9 uh, on the slide. The presence of particles such as ide, behold, or, or attention getting devices. The use of cataphoric demonstratives and orienters, such as tuto in tuto del lego. My point is this, is how Levinson paraphrases this in 317. Within clauses, the prominence giving devices may include the omission of the article with references to cognitively identifiable entities, meaning it's, it's already on your, your, uh, your desktop, your mental desktop, as in verse 219, where theo is contrasted with nomo, um, and it is focal and central to the argument. The omission of the article gives prominence to the contrasted elements. Uh, also, the preposing of focal constituents, as in 219 in the example above. Split focal constituents, as in 611. Um, 
as we see on the slide, where the size of the letters is in focus rather than the entire phrase, palikus gramasin, as a whole. So you've, you've separated the noun phrase into two parts to draw extra attention to the, the part that's, that's most toward the front. Violation of the principle of natural information flow by placing less, um, less established information before more established information. Nope, sorry. Okay, um, where you have the focal constituent kata uh, prosopon in the position, this position of P2, which would traditional grammar would call emphasis, which is non-established information, but it's followed immediately by the pronoun avto, um, and this is creating a, a stark transition from the most most important to the basically the, the most established information. Uh, the macro structure of the letter. My next step uh, when analyzing a text of the, in the, of the letter genre is to separate off what Betts calls the epistolary framework. So according to Breeze, the framework for a letter consists of the introduction, which relates the author to the recipients and gives a greeting, and the closure, which consists of personal notes and a benediction. In the case of Galatians, verses 1 to 5 would constitute that introduction, um, and 6.18 would provide the closure, which would leave 1.6 to 6.17 as the main body of the letter. So we, we would already have, you know, find similar conclusions from form criticism. As, a note, as I note elsewhere, a syndeton is typically found at the following transitions. So a syndeton meaning the, the lack of a, of a sentence conjunction of some kind. It would be used in a context um, from the opening salutation to the body of, the, of, of each letter, <clears throat> from the body of the letter to its closure, and from one major or minor topic to another, where there's no reason to, to, to have a connection between <clears throat> the major divisions. We expect the major divisions of the body of the letter to occur where there's a major change in theme. Since commentators often disagree as to where the major changes of the theme are found, um, we can evaluate each proposal by looking at the surface features or boundary features that might support or weaken it. In my experience, a proposal is well supported, supported if I can find three or more surface features to support it and none that weaken it. <clears throat> so for instance, uh, he's noted Beth's earlier comments about the division into um, the exordium, the narratio, the uh, propositio, and the probatio. And you have the divisions up there. So this section evaluates the evidence for a boundary feature between 110, 215, and 3.1. So it starts with 3.1. Um, as most, commentary, most commentators recognize a major division at this point. The following surface features may be cited as supporting evidence uh, for a division at 3-1. Ascenditon, uh, which is consistent of the shift, um, the initial vocative um, uh, or form of direct address, the rhetorical question, who has bewitched you, uh, the shift from first person in 218 to 21 to second person in 3-1, which would also be a, another uh, something associated with the boundary feature is a particular significance, given that the last reference to the Galatians as recipients of the letter was in 113. And finally, the labeling of the Galatians as foolish, which according to John Stott can be taken as, as an illusion, a weak back reference to 1.6. So we have five pieces of supporting evidence that are well supported. Contrast this uh, with... The, the, the support at 112. The sentence does begin with the fronted constituent of P1, ego, but as I noted in 2.4, the fronting of, of a previous, the fronting in the previous verse of to evangelion, to evangelist, uh, evangelistin hupemu, um, has, was already presented, has already presented the theme for the section, and even Betts observes, in verse 12, the simple denial of verse 11 is made more explicit. Also, whereas no overt, overt connective is found in 3.1, gar is used in 1.12, uh, 
uh, which indicates that what follows strengthens the material. So even though it may introduce an embedded section, it's still closely connected by the basis on the basis of GAR to what precedes. Uh, 2.15, the following surface features may, can be cited as supporting evidence for a division. A syndetin, which is consistent with the shift of a major, uh, major topic to another. The fronted constituent pronoun in P1, hemis, uh, which signals a change of topic from Sue, uh, which would be Peter, and we, the Jews, who, uh, who know that we are justified by faith alone. This is some supporting evidence for a division at 2.15 then. However, is the division within the letter as a whole, as Beth's analysis would seem to apply, or is it a division within Paul's reported speech to Peter? We cannot know with certainty how many of these verses are a continuation of his speech. Because of the we in 2.15 does not include the Gentile Christians, though, the Gentile recipients of the letter would have assumed that Paul was still addressing Peter, um, together with the other Jewish Christians who were not present at the time. It is noteworthy, too, that Paul switches from first person plural to singular at some point at which Gar, at the same point um, at which Gar introduces information that supports his earlier assertions. So it would not be unreasonable to, to suppose that 214 to 17 constitute Paul's speech with 18 to 21 providing support for the Galatians' benefit, whether or not these words were spoken to Peter or not. I conclude then that Betz's divisions at 112 and 215 are not on the same level as 31, so they may be a lower level division, but that's obscured by his um, outline. Many divisions and commentaries uh, make divisions between 110 and 111, so I now examine the evidence for a division there, together with the effect of reading Gar uh, in NA28 versus the variant De as a connective that links one, uh, 111 to its context. If we follow NA28 in reading Gar at 111, then four successive verses begin with Gar, 110 through 113, and its presence indicates that what follows strengthens the material presented in the immediate context. Thus, Hendrickson writes that the Gar at 111, quote, in connection with the present context, for uh, must mean something like in justification for the facts which I have stated, namely that my gospel is of divine origin and the only true gospel, so that anyone who distorts it is accursed. Note that the following corroborative facts selected from the story of my life. Uh, the presence of Gar in these verses indicates what John Stott calls the solemn curse of 118, which is repeated in 19, sorry, 18, repeated in 19 to give it prominence, is strengthened in 110, which in turn in 11 is strengthened, um, strengthens verses 11 and, uh, and worth 12, strengthening 11, and then 13 through 214, strengthening uh, verse 12. So if you look at figure one on the handouts, which I hope you have, um, which I do not have, there were no handouts. Most of the content was on the handouts as well. Is there a handout? Some have, some don't. It's on the back. Okay. Uh, whereas... 111 should be taken as the beginning of a macro unit. The following surface features can be cited as supporting evidence for second level division at 111. The orienter, um, gonorizo humen, uh, the vocative adolfu, and the fronting of the um, to evangelion, to evangelistin, hupemu. Um, Although the preferred reading of NA28 is at 111 is Gar, Longnecker is among a number of scholars who favor reading De as the connective that introduces what follows. Since De constrains what follows to be processed as a distinct point that advances the argument, it can be cited as further support, as further supporting evidence for a second level division at 111. So this would be figure two on the handout. Illustrates the effect of these two different readings. It affects the, the overall structure of this section. 
Um, as for the unity of the theme in 1.6 through 2.21, the autobiographical material of 1.13 to 2.10 supports the declarations of 1.11 to 12. Uh, in turn, the account of this confrontation with Peter in 11 to 14 supports the condemnation of those who proclaim, quote, a gospel contrary to what you have received in 1.9, as well as showing that Paul was not seeking human approval, but God's approval in 1.10. As noted earlier, um, as we noted earlier, we cannot know for certainty how much of 215 to 21 is a continuation of Paul's speech to Peter. What is certain is that these verses contribute to the rejection of those who proclaim the gospel contrary to what we proclaim to you in verse 8. Uh, for if justification comes by the law, then Christ died for nothing at 221. I conclude that Morris is right to treat 1.6 to 2.21 as a single thematic unit with secondary division at verse 11, at 111. The internal uh, structure of a macro unit. Having evaluated the different proposals as to how the body of the letter or other text is to be divided into macro units on the basis of the major changes, the major change of theme, and having looked at the surface features that would tend to confirm or negate each one, we move on to the internal structure of each macro unit to determine how the argument of the unit is developed and which parts of the unit have been given prominence. To illustrate this procedure, we'll look at 1 6 through 221. We have just seen that within the macro structure of 6, uh, 1, 6 to 221, we have a second level division. Uh, in turn, 11, uh, verses 11 to 12 um, present an expository thesis that then serves as that thesis through the balance of the section. Um, which is then strengthened by the autobiographical, autobiographical section that begins in 113 and continues at least until 214. Uh, when, as in 111 to 12, a positive assertion precedes two or more uh, negative statements, this may be viewed as a slowing down, a slowing down device that gives prominence to the positive assertion. So we see this in several different places. Um, so. If we even go up to the introduction, Paul spends more time talking about what kind of an apostle he's not than what kind he is. Uh, in verses 3 through 14, uh, 1, 13 through 14, the apostle describes his pre-conversion state in Judaism um, and the imperfect tense, in, uh, the meaning imperfective aspect, ediokon, uh, talking about these behaviors that were characteristic of him that serve as a backdrop and is consistent with these activities serving as a background uh, in relation to the subsequent experiences. Uh, as noted in 2.5, De in 1.15 um, introduces a distinct point that advances Paul's argument, namely what he did after Jesus Christ first revealed himself. This unit, as well as the three introduced by Ipita next, and a time expression at 118 to 20, so the units would be 118 to 20, 21 to 24, and 2, 1 to 10, uh, all show that I did not receive the gospel that was received by me from a human source, nor was I taught it, 112. Uh, the four sentences make up Four sentences make up 115 to 17, and the connectives used to link them are all associative, associative or additive. The unit begins with a complex adverbial clause of time, which introduces a lengthy description of God's work in Paul, see, uh, as we see on the slide. This clause provides the point of departure for the nuclear part of the sentence. Uh, as in 11 to 12, the placement of the two negative statements, I did not confer with anyone, didn't go up to Jerusalem, um, Allah, uh, and then you have the positive that follows, but went away to Arabia. The two negatives provide a slowing. Finally, and I'll skip the, um, the assertions. Well, you have that on, you have figure three on your handout? Okay. Um, the handout shows how the overall argumentation of 111 to 214 is developed um, with and which elements have been given prominence. Conclusion. 
this paper is argued for the, in the first instance, for the importance of being aware of advances in discourse analysis in the wider linguistic scene, as we should expect proposals about disc discourse features of New Testament Greek to make sense in other languages, especially those in which aspect rather than tense is prominent. It has been outlined, it is then outlined a series of steps that a Bible scholar uh, might follow when considering the discourse structure of the Greek text of a New Testament book. Divisions of the text into smaller units will, uh, will be based on perceived changes in theme, but surface features of the text can help the, the analyst evaluate the relative merits of conflicting proposals. No, Siri, I did not call you. Uh, sorry, my phone was waiting for a command of some kind. Um, divisions of the text into smaller units will be based on perceived changes of theme, but surface features of the text can help the analyst evaluate the relative merits of conflicting proposals as to how the text should be divided. Uh, Greek has a rich collection of intersentential particles and conjunctions, such as uh, each of which indicates a specific way of relating what follows to the context. So flow charts can be produced as to how the argument of a passage is developed and supported. And I'm working on a project to work through these to develop similar diagrams for the New Testament epistles. Most of the Paulines are done. We have reached slide 93, and I don't think we have any time for questions unless it's up to, I think we're at a break. Okay. Thank you very much.